So um, a, a very warm welcome, uh, everybody, um, to the uh, Zika workshop today. Thanks very much for coming along. I know you had a choice of, I sound like an airline pilot, I know you had a choice of airlines today. You had a choice of, of workshops. So thanks for coming to this one. Um, we've got um, quite a lot to cover um, in not a very large space of time, although we have actually, unfortunately, lost one of our speakers because we had to move the, the session from the afternoon to the morning. And unfortunately, Juliana... Uh, who was our first speaker, can't actually make it, so she won't be giving her, uh, her presentation. But nevertheless, we have an, a very exciting um, agenda. We've got um, some great speakers um, who I'll introduce uh, in just a second before we get into the discussion, because I'd quite like it to be as interactive as possible. It's meant to be a workshop. It's not just about presentations. So really, the presentations are about setting the scene, um, and then hopefully we can get into a bit of a uh, a discussion about Zika in a sort of broader context, as, as Marianne uh, mentioned previously. So I'm sure none of us are um, strangers to um, the Zika virus. It's been in the headlines for a long time, although it's kind of fallen out of the headlines um, more recently. Um, it was declared a public health emergency of international concern in February uh, last year by the WHO. Um, it's no longer... Um, of that status, uh, but it's still here. Um, it's still around, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, but I thought just as a, a sort of um, uh, entry into the workshop, we just sort of remind ourselves a little bit about the Zika virus and, and how it uh, reared its head uh, last year. So we've known about it for a while. We've known about it since 1947 when it was discovered um, in, um, in a monkey, in a macaque, in uh, Uganda. Um, now, it's probably been a, around a long before that, but that was the first time it was discovered. Um, it then just hopped across to um, uh, Indonesia and Southeast Asia and Australasia um, before going into the Pacific Islands and then hopping across in 2015 uh, to Brazil and then spread very rapidly um, within uh, South America, as I'm sure we all know. Um, if we look at the cumulative number of countries and territories, um, reporting Zika transmission for the first time, um, you can see how this explosion occurred. So sort of trundling along there in 2015, then suddenly you get this massive number in countries reporting um, Zika. And then it sort of plateaus towards the end of last year. And these are the countries mainly uh, affected. Um, so mainly the Americas, pretty much right the way throughout the Americas. But there are some other countries there. You can see in Africa um, and in uh, uh, Australasia that are reporting uh, Zika for the first time um, as well. So that's kind of a reminder, I guess, of, of, of how um, Zika emerged. And it is, uh, still promise, in 83, 86 countries, sorry, um, around the world. And Zika is, is still a problem. I spoke to a colleague of mine who is running some cohort studies um, in Brazil uh, just yesterday. Um, and she said that infection rates in pregnancy uh, in some areas of Brazil are as high as 3%, um, which is still very high um, in some areas. It's gone down in other areas, and generally it's gone down quite dramatically. Um, but it is still there, and we don't really know what it's going to be doing um, in the future. Now, one of the positive things I think about Zika, if you can say anything positive about it, is that I think it really has uh, raised the profile um, of vector-borne diseases. And it also gave us a bit of a, a kick up the backside in many ways in that, you know, we, we realised that we weren't well prepared at all for this and for Aedes-borne diseases in general. And because of that, uh, funding has become available. Um, lots of projects have, have been initi initiated um, and are discovering new things that will benefit not just Zika but other vector-borne diseases as well. Um, the, the WHO launched their Global Vector Control Response um, just uh, earlier this year, um, which Anna from WHO, is, uh, I'm sure, will, will tell us a bit about um, in her presentation. Um, and, you know, the important thing, as I said, is that when we're targeting uh, Zika as vector control specialists, we're targeting the Aedes mosquito, and that means we're targeting more than just Zika. We're also targeting dengue, chikungunya, yellow fever, um, uh, and those sorts of arboviruses as well. So it goes much beyond that. But the truth is, when it comes to Aedes-borne diseases, I think we're really unprepared. Um, there was a fantastic review from the Liverpool School that came out last year, which demonstrated that um, for, if you look at all the vector control studies that have been done for dengue in particular, um, 
about 1,000 studies have been done since 1980. Uh, 20 of those studies were good, had good enough quality data to be included in a meta-analysis, and only nine of those were randomized control trials. Um, that's quite embarrassing, um, and I think a really big problem, um, and it's a bit of a wake-up call, I think, for us all, to standardize the work that we're doing and try to raise the standards of, um, of the studies that we perform. Um, I think also this... Um, quote here from Margaret Chan uh, when she was Director General of WHO. Above all, the spread of Zika, the resurgence of dengue and the emerging threat of chikungunya are the price being paid for a massive policy failure that dropped the ball on mosquito control in the 1970s. So we had all but eradicated Aedes aegypti mosquitoes in South America uh, until this point um, where the control stopped and it came back with a vengeance. And now we have problems with insecticide resistance and all sorts of uh, other things um, as well. So um, I talked about the, the fact that there is more funding now. I thought I'd very briefly just mention um, one of the projects that, um, that we're working on at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, so in, in response to the Zika outbreak, um, three consortia were formed, uh, funded by the EU. Um, one is called Zika Plan, uh, another one called Zika Action, uh, and another one called Zika Alliance. Um, I was hoping somebody from Zika Action was going to be here, Claire, but I don't see her. She might come in in a second. Um, Zika Plan stands for Zika Preparedness Latin American uh, Network, um, and it's a huge consortium, uh, 12 million euros. It's being led by Annalise Wilder-Smith at UMEA in Sweden, and the London School is the one of the major partners, um, but it does involve 25 partners um, in uh, 12 countries around the world, mainly in, in Europe uh, and South America. Um, the objectives of the consortium is, uh, are, are quite broad, um, so we're, we're sort of looking at it in two phases. First of all, we're addressing Zika, so we're looking at uh, congenital Zika syndrome. We've got cohort studies um, in Brazil and other parts of the world, and neurological complications, pathogenesis, and non-vector transmission, so we're looking at sexual, sexual transmission. Uh, we're doing a bit on vector control, um, uh, and uh, that's part of the, uh, one of the work packages that I'm leading, and we're looking specifically at developing uh, personal protection methods for, uh, specifically for women of childbearing age or pregnant women um, to protect them, and we're doing some focus group studies in Colombia and Brazil at the moment, and then doing some product development uh, working with industry. Uh, diagnostic tools, um, and also viral fitness. But one of the important things about this consortium as well is beyond Zika. So we're re we responded to the Zika outbreak, and part of this project is to set up um, response preparedness and capacity in South America so that we can continue to respond to Zika, but also anything else that, that comes our way, particularly when it comes to Aedes-borne uh, uh, diseases. Um, so we have a whole load of work packages around that element specifically. One of the other things that we're doing in, uh, that we're leading from the school is the setup of uh, the Global Vector Hub. Um, this is an online resource um, which, will, uh, which aims to be an information resource. What is where in the world? What are, they, what's, what are they biting? What are they transmitting? What's the epidemiology that goes with that? Uh, and also building a community of practice. Um, so it's about building a network, who is where in the world, what are they doing, what is their capacity for vector control research, um, and who is, work, who is working in areas that are linked to vector control but not necessarily directly on vector control. It will bring in industry as well. They're obviously very big players when it comes to vector control. Um, and it will also be a training resource with, uh, with guidelines, with um, online seminars, um, and other resources and, and online uh, research tools that anybody can access freely anywhere in the world. And we're working with various organizations um, to create this, this online resource at the moment. So if anybody's interested in that, please do drop us a line um, and, and get involved if you'd like to be. I'm hoping you all will be in some way or another. Um, and just to mention very briefly as well, we also have a Zika MOOC. Um, it's now, I think, in its seventh run. Um, we've had more than this, probably about 20,000 participants um, so far. So if you want to know anything more about Zika and the vectors, um, then please do uh, register um, for the Zika MOOC. Um, but it brings me on to um, this extremely important point um, with Zika. So the reason it was declared a public health emergency of international concern is because of this, mainly. Because of um, the microcephaly um, or congenital Zika syndrome, these um, effects that were being recorded in, un, uh, in, in children being born 
uh, from mothers who had contracted the Zika virus. Um, really, really devastating effects. Unprecedented. Really, you know, if, if uh, a couple of years ago you had asked, what about Zika? We'd say, well, you know, flu-like symptoms, probably nothing very bad. Only 20% of people get symptoms. You get a bit of a rash and red eyes. Uh, but that's about it, really. Well, we were very, very wrong. Um, and, you know, that, those are the, the consequences. And I think this, the important thing is that... Um, these children, you know, some of them have died, some of them will die, some of them will live uh, and will live to adulthood but will be severely disabled. Um, and some of the families of those children uh, or the families of those children have to, have to cope with that. They have to live with that as well. I heard somebody at one conference say something like the, um, the forgotten generation or the lost generation, the Zika babies, which is absolute rubbish because they're still here and they will continue to be here. Um, and I think there's a bit of, sometimes a bit of a disconnect between the vector control world and this, this world, in, in fact, because um, you know, the majority of communities that we work with that we're trying to protect with vector control are living with disability. Um, something like 15% of the world's population um, are living with disability. Hannah can correct me on this if I'm wrong. Um, and 80% of, of those people are in developing countries. And those are the, the communities that we are targeting, that we are working with. So what I'd like to do today in this workshop is to think about um, you know, some of the lessons that we've learned from the, the, the response to the Zika outbreak. Um, I'd also like to try and define um, some of the research priorities going forward. And Julia Nettwistle, um, who's here with the IVCC, um, is going to be talking to us a, a bit about some of the work he's been doing in that area um, very shortly. Um, but also think a bit about how we can integrate better um, disability and, and, and vector control um, because, you know, I think this is a, a, in some ways a bit of a neglected area from our point of view and it really should be part of it. We should have this sort of holistic approach um, to the work that we're doing and communicating with, with these people. So um, that's why we have um, some fantastic speakers lined up. Um, we have... Um, uh, Anna Jexler from the, the World Health Organization who's going to talk to us about the, the WHO response and uh, we've got Hannah Cooper from uh, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine who's going to be ta talking to us about her work on disability uh, and Zika and Julian Entwistle from the IVCC who will talk to us about research priorities and then it's up to you guys um, and hopefully we can have a really interactive um, discussion so I'm going to shut up now and hand over to Anna um, who is going to um, give a presentation